Hey guys, Laura here with STP. If I was a student and I didn't have a lot of time to prep for the digital SAT, I would make sure I knew how to do these three questions in the digital SAT English modules because they make up 65% of the points. The three types of questions I'm talking about are transitions, standard English convention, and word and context questions. So in this video, I am going to show you practical tips and strategies for how to tackle these three types of questions so you can maximize your points and minimize your study. Now, if you want to work on these three categories even more, then make sure you go to our website and download our digital SAT workbook for free. We're giving it away at no cost for limited time if you subscribe to our email list. So I'm going to link up here to our website so you can go sign up today and get that workbook and get prepping. All right, first guys, before we get started, this video is brought to you by Preply, the fun digital SAT prep app that's available in the App Store and in Google Play. If you're looking for a different way to increase your SAT score and you're sick of being tied down to a computer, practicing full length tests every time you need to prep, Preply is a perfect alternative for you. You can prep from the convenience of your mobile device when you're out and about, and you can do a little bit here and a little bit there with our short time quizzes and our drill mode. So I will link up here so you can go grab properly today and take your prep to the next level. All right, let's get started and talk about transition questions first. Transition questions start at around number 20 on each English module. So they come right after the standard English convention questions and right before the note taking questions. There are roughly four to five transition questions per module, so you're looking at like an extra eight to 10 points. Now, it's important to understand the different types of transition questions you will see to get good at this type of question. I like to keep it simple and I put the transition words into four major categories. The first category is what's called supports. A support transition essentially is a detail that backs up the main argument or the topic sentence of the paragraph. For example, words like also, moreover, in addition, and likewise are all support words. The second major category are contrast words. Contrast transitions essentially link two sentences and they go against each other. So one sentence might be positive, the other sentence might be negative. Common contrast transition words are however, nevertheless, and regardless. The next major transition category you will encounter are called causation words. Causation words essentially uh, evoke a cause and effect situation. So the first sentence causes the second sentence to occur. So some example causation words are thus, therefore, and consequently. The last major category is what I like to call reinforcers. Reinforcers essentially are sentences that restate or reword the previous sentence in a different way. So there's a three-step process for efficiently tackling transition questions. The first step is when you get to the answer choices, categorize them. The second step is to read the sentence before the blank and the sentence that the blank is in to determine the relationship between them. That way you'll know what category transition word you need. The third step, and this is just a shortcut, is to cross off any answer choices that come from the same category transition words. So, if you see two causation words that function the same exact way, like thus and therefore, cross them off because there's only one right answer and multiple choice. All right, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna work out a transition question with you so you can see these strategies and steps in action. So as you can see, we're on an example here and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna categorize these transition answer choices. Alternatively is a contrast. But it's a specific type of contrast because it's really talking about different options. Like I might say, I'll eat the steak. Alternatively, I'll eat the chicken. So if you're not sure what category a transition word goes into, try to put it in a context and use it in a sentence and that'll help you determine what situation and what type it is. Consequently, is a causation which makes perfect sense because we have the root S-E-Q, which is 
basically uh, goes into the math term sequence. If you think about a math sequence, it's one thing happening after another. So consequently, is something happening as a result of something else. In fact, is a reinforcer, and moreover, is a support. Okay, I can't cross any off. They're all from different categories. Now what I'm going to do is read the first sentence and the second sentence to determine a relationship. So it says, although T.S. Eliot devoted several years to writing The Wasteland, it sold only about 330 copies in the six months following its publication. That word only tells me that that's a negative sentence. I'm going to play positive negative and make a mental note. Okay, that's a negative sentence. Now I'm going to read the second part. Elliot was forced to seek other sources of income. That also sounds negative to me. So I know they're not going against each other. It's not a contrast. I'm going to cross out A. This to me sounds just like a cause and effect situation. Because he only sold 330 copies, he was forced to go seek other sources of income. So I'm going to go with the causation. All right, let's talk about standard English convention questions now. Standard English convention questions come at the very middle of the module around number 15. And you have about four to five standard English convention questions in each module as well, which is another eight to 10 points. So I typically recommend to my students that they actually jump to number 15 and start with these when they get to a module because these are quick, easy points if you know the rules. There's very specific things that they test now in this digital SAT. You want to get good at knowing the punctuation rules. You want to get good at knowing how to place commas in the right spots. And you want to get good at being able to link a subject to the right verb. So I'm actually going to do a few examples with you right now to show you how to tackle these effectively. The first example I'm going to show you guys deals with subject verb agreement. You'll know you're on a subject verb agreement question because the answer choices will all be different verb tenses. So in this case, I can see is, are, have, been, and were. Those are verbs of being. So, you know, Verbs, although they're typically action words like jump and run, um, these are also verbs as well. So don't count these out. It's very easy for students to mistake them for something else, but these are verbs as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the sentence that the blank is in and I'm going to try to pinpoint my subject. So it says, for engineers, the elimination of sonic booms blank one of the biggest challenges involved. Okay. I know that my subject is the elimination because of sonic booms is just extra information describing more about the elimination. Anytime you see an of clause, cross it off when you're on this type of question because that is not the subject, it's the word that came right before it. So it's a singular subject and when I read it, the elimination is one of the biggest challenges. Now, I know and I can validate that my answer is correct because another trick that you can use is to test singular, plural, and the answer choices. This is the only singular tense. I can say he is, right? But I would say they are, they have been, and they were. So you want to find the one that's different and you want to find the only singular tense or the only plural tense because that's going to be the right one. Okay, the next example I want to go over with you guys are comma placement questions because these are huge on the digital SAT. So there's a big strategy that I like to use, which is basically read the sentence and listen to where you pause. That's probably where the commas need to go. You can also use the strategy of determining if something's essential or non-essential. Let me highlight and show you what I mean by this example. So it says Ada Lovelace and her acquaintance Charles Babbage were two of the most influential figures. Okay, already from the way that I read it out loud, you could hear me read it without pausing. So I'm already leaning towards picking B. But if you weren't sure, or you know, you have your doubts, what you can do essentially is like, look at answer choice A. If we put Charles Babbage in between two commas, that would mean that that part is not essential. If we took it out, will the sentence still be okay and make sense? If we said Ada Lovelace and her acquaintance were two of the most influential figures, well now we're losing an important piece of information. 
They gave her name, so they should give his name too, especially if they're influential. That means they're important. So we wouldn't be able to take his name out because then it wouldn't really give us the information that we need. Um, so that's how you can eliminate A. And then C and C would be incorrect because you're not going to have, uh, it's very rare that you would have a comma right before the verb. You don't pause before the verb. If you have a subject and then a verb, you read right through that. And then if you look at D, you wouldn't pause between acquaintance and Charles Babbage either. So you could be confident in going with B. Again, I would just keep it simple and read it out loud and listen to if I need to pause or not. And at the end of the day, if you're narrowed down to two and you're not sure which one to pick, pick the one with less commas in it. You'll have a better chance of picking up the point. All right, the last example I wanna look at with you is dealing with what I call lead-ins. And this is super, super popular on the digital SAT, so you need to be aware of this. This will be on your test. Now, as you can see, this example is from a paper test, but that doesn't matter. It's still the same on the digital SAT. I have basically an introduction to the sentence with a comma. Now, here's a digital SAT question. So the way that you can pinpoint that you're on a lead-in is if you see a comma and then the blank right after it, chances are the part before it is a lead-in and they're about to introduce the subject and what they're going to be talking about. And that's exactly what a lead-in does. It warms you up and gets you ready to um, to understand a little bit more about the subject. So if I say approaching a doorway in which dangles a red envelope filled with green paper money, my subject has to come right after that here. So your subject comes right after the lead-in. And the subject has to be whatever was approaching a doorway. So whatever they talked about in that lead-in, that is the subject. Well, if we go through our answer choices, answer choice A says the lion's teeth. Would it make sense for the lion's teeth to be approaching a doorway? No, that's not the subject. Would an envelope approach a doorway? No, that's not the subject. Would the teeth of the lion approach the doorway? No, that's not the subject. The only subject that makes sense here would be the lion because it's the only thing that would be approaching the doorway. So that's how you tackle lead-ins. All right, guys, the last type of question we are going to look at is what's called a words and context question. So these come at the very beginning of the English modules, and you're gonna have roughly four to five words and context questions as well. So that's another eight to 10 points. So as you can see, these three categories really do make up most of the module. Now, the challenge of words and context questions is a lot of students, their vocabularies are weak. Maybe you're in that category. If you are, comment below for me. Let me know what you think about your lexicon. Do you have a strong lexicon? Do you have a weak lexicon? If you didn't know lexicon meant vocabulary, maybe you need to work on your vocabulary more. But there are a few key strategies you can use even when you have a weak vocabulary to still get the questions right. So let's talk about those. The first strategy is you can play positive negative. So if you read the text and it sounds positive, pick a positive sounding word. The second strategy that you can use is linguistics. Words are comprised of parts, typically Latin and Greek roots. So if you know roots, prefixes and suffixes and their meanings, for instance, if I put the prefix a in front of a word, it means without. So apathy means without feelings. That will help you figure out what words mean without memorizing thousands of definitions. Your third strategy is to look for synonyms in the text. There's going to be a definition somewhere in the text nearby, especially after like an interesting punctuation mark, like a colon or a semicolon, really look out for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over a words and context question with you just to show you how it works. So, I'm going to read this little paragraph first and try to play positive negative. So it says, since decades old regimens developed for the later stages of cancer uh, have little success and harm the entire body, focusing on the first stages of cancer would be more effective and cheaper. Okay, when I kind of get a sense of what's going on here with positive and negative, the decades old regimens developed for later stages sound like bad. So that is not good. 
but they, it sounds like they have a solution. If you focus on the first stages, it would be more effective and cheaper. That sounds good. It says, thus, Professor of Medicine, Dr. Azar Raza, an international authority on pre-leukemia and leukemia, blank the traditional slash poison burn approach to treating cancer. Okay. So I need to figure out, does this word need to be positive or negative here? And I'm not really sure because there's a part of it is, in the text is positive and part of it is negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to pinpoint the definition or a synonym to the word that I need in the blank. Now it's describing the traditional approach, which is a synonym to a decade old regimen. Well, the decade old regimen was negative, right? So I know I need a negative word in the blank. Well, bolsters sounds positive to me, and it is. Reinforces sounds positive to me, and it is. Would it make more sense for him to control or rebut? Rebut sounds more negative to me than controls. Controls kind of sounds neutral, so I'm going to go with A. So that's how you can get a words and context question right, even if you don't know what all the words mean. All right, guys, if you want to dive into these different types of questions even deeper, we have an awesome digital SAT English self-paced course. So I'm going to link it up here if you want to go check that out. If you put in the promo code 50 off at checkout, you can get $50 off this course since you are a YouTube viewer of mine and I love you guys so much. All right, that's it for now. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, comment below 65% with a brain emoji. I really appreciate you sticking it out with me to the very end. And I have no doubt this stick to of yours is going to help you succeed on your next SAT. So until next time, guys, happy prepping.